regarding my background vis-a-vis -vis Italy and my interest in Italian art, I studied for a year, like many good Americans do, in Florence, where I first fell in love with, with Italian art. Um, I had already been to Italy many times. Um, I have family in Milan. But then, of course, there is the, the great treasures of art that, um, that reside in Italy. And so I had the chance in Florence to study very up close both the great works of the Italian Renaissance and, the, and particularly the Renaissance there, but also the Baroque. Arte Povera I came to slightly later than that, um, and that was really through my studies at, at, um, in graduate school, um, looking at art of the 60s and 70s. In terms of a movement, Arte Povera is an interesting one because there was never really a manifesto at first to, to kind of claim it as such. Arte Povera was really founded in a rather oblique fashion, I would say. The critic um, Germano Celant he was the one who wrote in 1967, who began to call them poveristi, and who, who named this kind of loose association of artists, arte povera. Um, and he, as part of that process, had been spending time in Torino with Mario and Marisa Mertz. And so always already from the beginning, Marisa was part of this loose affiliation. Um, because of her associations with her husband, but also with the whole group of friends and colleagues and collaborators. Um, that said, throughout those first few years in the later 60s and into the early 70s, there were many instances where Marisa was not necessarily credited for being part of a show. Um, maybe she decided herself not to participate in an exhibition. And so there was a bit of ambiguity about how involved she was with that movement. Part of the beauty of being able to organize this exhibition was spending a lot of time both with Marisa herself in, in, in Torino, and she still lives and works there. Um, she's 90, she will be 91 in April. Um, uh, she still works every day. And so th with, through many conversations between me and Connie Butler, my co-curator from Los Angeles on this exhibition, and also Beatrice Mertz, Marisa's daughter, um, who runs the Fondazione Mertz now in Turin. The collaboration with the artist and with her daughter, um, and also I should say Mariano Boggia, who has been Mario and Marisa's very long time studio assistant. All of those collaborations were really important to bringing this show together. Um, Beatrice and Mariano were both here for the installation. Marisa no longer travels, um, as she said to us, um, at, one, um, at one of our visits, she said, I've traveled so much in my life um, that I don't feel a need to do so anymore. And we're very understanding of that. Um, that. Luckily, we were able to have collaborators who know the work so well to help me install the show as, as kind of truthfully and, and to, to Marisa as I could. And the challenge was very much to, because this is the first U.S. retrospective for this amazingly important artist, um, to represent the work for an audience here in the United States that may not know it at all. And so to try and give a chronological scope, a kind of biographical arc to the picture um, of the work, but also to stay true to really Marisa's practice, which is to make work that, is, that she never likes to date or even sometimes title. So how do you represent this work that kind of overlays itself, where pieces of the installation are taken from older works um, and added on to newer works, and the work is always kind of ever present and ever being remade. How do you put that into a chronology that the public can understand? And the title for the exhibition, Marisa Mertz, The Sky is a Great Place, comes from another aspect of the practice, which is one of writing. Um, so in looking through pages and sheets of drawings in the studio, we came across many examples of Marisa's writing. And so one of the other things we did for the catalog was to read, was to translate for the first time many of these um, poems and writings by Marisa into English, and they, they form a great section of the catalog. So the subtitle for the show, This Guy is a Great Space, comes from one of the lines of poetry that Marisa wrote. It also reminds us of a very important early performance that Marisa did um, in an airport near Rome in 1970, where she got a pilot to fly her up in the air. Um, 
and she is photographed doing that. And then while she's in the air, she's re reciting a series of numbers um, and counting the altitude. And so this kind of performative practice where she herself becomes a kind of airborne performative person um, also speaks, I think, to the expansiveness of her vision. I think, I think part of, I think one of the main, main goals of the show is to really introduce this artist to the U.S. audience. And we're very lucky that we can do that here in New York and then also in Los Angeles where the exhibition will travel in June. And so two very important cities in the U.S. for art, um, Los Angeles and New York. Places where, of course, Marisa has exhibited before, more perhaps in New York than Los Angeles, but very few and far between. Um, the exhibition includes uh, 50 years of work, basically, yeah, exactly. Um, and it includes everything from works like these that I stand in front of made out of aluminum from very early in the career, other experiments from those years um, uh, that use hemp or chicken wire or wood. Um, then in the 1970s, she begins to mold uh, the testine, the, the heads, out of, out of clay. There's also, of course, her, two of her uh, fountains, which are very beautiful. So there's a, a, an enormous range of materials. Now she's using spray paint in a fantastic way, and so you have this very diminutive but forceful woman um, clam climbing on top of her platform that she uses in the studio to spray these beautiful drawings on very large pieces of hand-laid paper. Um, that was represent the most recent works in the show. To get a full kind of scope of the career, um, all kinds of works in media, in, in all these various media. We have a very important early work in addition to the living sculpture that's here in the galleries on loan for the exhibition. And it's really one of the first times it's been on view in public in many, many years, and that's the, um, the wall sculpture called Bea. Bea is, of course, the short version of Beatrice. Bea also is, um, it's, a, it's a work that's knitted out of nylon thread. And so again, it speaks to this kind of domestic work, the kind of work that Marisa was doing in the years when she is watching her child grow up. And, um, and so she finds the time, and she still lives and works in the same, you know, in the same place, so that her studio is also in the apartment where she eats and where she sleeps. Um, so at the kitchen table, perhaps, she's knitting these letters, um, B, E, and A, to form the sculpture Bea. And she leaves the needles there lodged in the work, so the viewer sees the mode in which they were made. The swing, La Altalena, is an ex one of two examples of, of swings that Marisa made um, theoretically to put, so that her daughter could play in the space, right? So at that point, um, Beatrice is seven or eight. Um, when I first was looking at the work, I was thinking of putting a baby on that. It doesn't seem very possible, but of course, Bea is a little older than that. But it speaks to this interest in the kind of playfulness with space, but also using architecture as a way to determine um, the way her work is viewed. Um, I think, but I think the idea of play um, something practical, something furniture-like, too, is also important. Um, yes, they have a slightly different meaning when they enter the museum space, but they recall, they're sort of redolent of this incredible space of the studio that is both the apartment that they live in and the place where all of this creativity occurs. And so there's very little um, of a dividing line between art and life. And I think that's one of the things that's so compelling about it, actually, for artists who are working and living today that this is an artwork which speaks of an experience that's very personal, um, but also speaks to the architectural space in which it's made, into its possibilities over time. There's so many aspects that will be attractive to an artist working today.